Today we're pleased to discuss one of the most long-awaited, critical, and in many ways visionary projects um, in, our, in the peninsula area. I'm talking about the flood control project uh, being spearheaded by the San Francisco Creek Joint Powers Authority. And we're thrilled to have with us as our guest this week, uh, Len Materman, the executive director of uh, the SFC JPA, San Francisco Creek. So thank you so much for joining us, Len. My pleasure. Well, um, the project hit a big milestone last week. He had a gro groundbreaking ceremony, which usually is a starting line. In this case, it feels a little bit like a finish line almost because of how long it took to get there. And I think um, a good place to start would just be kind of talk about what the project entails and just kind of give a brief description of what um, residents in Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, Menlo Park could expect in the next couple of years as this unfolds. Sure, so this is our project uh, that is between the Bay and Highway 101. And it's uh, driven by objectives for flood control. And that is 100-year uh, creek flow with extreme tides and three feet of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And this is an area of the creek, San Francisco Creek, that's affected by bay tides daily. So it's, the sea level rise is a real issue there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and this project has been a long time in the making, as Janani just said. Um, the project will widen the creek into the Palo Alto Golf Course. Mm -hmm. And it will raise the levees that are out there now. It will, it will actually take down the levees and build new ones. Um, and it will build flood walls between these Palo Alto homes and the area around the International School. And, uh, and it will open up the creek to part of the marsh that's north of the creek. So all of that combined provides flood protection. It also has ecosystem benefits because it creates about 15 acres of new marshland. Um, and, uh, and it will improve the trail system out there. But there will be a lot of impacts. The construction is for the next two and a half years. And certainly in that area, people in East Palo Alto and Palo Alto, both sides will have substantial impacts. And I think it would be uh, useful to kind of understand a little bit about uh, why this particular location is chosen as a starting point, because the creek obviously goes much longer than that. But uh, you're focusing on the downstream area, East Palo Alto. Uh, why is this a number one priority? Right. Uh, so certainly there are flood, flooding issues upstream of Highway 101 or west of 101. And uh, Palo Alto saw that, and Menlo Park saw that around the Pope Chaucer Bridge uh, on multiple occasions. The reason that we start farther downstream is it, we cannot open up the, the creek to greater capacity upstream and send more water down in an area that we know already floods. That would increase the risk or create new risk on different people, diff a different population um, from where, where we're fixing it. So we start downstream, we open up the system, create more capacity, and we work our way upstream. So this stretch is by far the longest stretch of a particular project that we would do because it's about 7,000 feet of creek from the bay to East Bay Shore Road, Highway 101. Um, this project will be then followed, well, concurrently it's being done with a Caltrans project mm -hmm. to replace the bridge over the creek at Highway 101 and the frontage roads. And, uh, and Caltrans is using our design criteria for flow. Right. And then we have in the planning and design phases right now projects upstream of there uh, between essentially 101 and uh, Pope Chaucer Bridge. Mm -hmm. So the capacity issues are certainly one of them, but I also understand just based on history, 1998 there was a huge flood, 2012 there was a pretty uh, big flood. Mm -hmm. This is one of the more vulnerable areas, right, uh, as far as uh, cities around the creek. Uh, and, and I think this project would protect like 5,700 homes, I believe, that was in Sue's story. Yeah, 5,700 is the number actually not just for this project, but also areas upstream. That's oh, okay. the number in the 100-year floodplain. Um, and that's kind of the most extreme floodplain. A lot of properties would get flooded at much lower, uh, smaller storms, lower flows. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the 100-year floodplain. Um, so this, this project um, would kind of take out of the, of the flood risk the most vulnerable areas. And the reason they're the most vulnerable in terms of substantial damage or loss of life is because these homes are below sea level and the levee that's currently there uh, is above their roof lines in many cases. And so when water goes into East Palo Alto in this situation, it has no chance to escape. And so you, you have kind of a, a very critical issue if there's a big flow. And we've seen that a couple times. In 2012, there was a small flow and it flooded homes. Um, it wasn't life-threatening, but in that kind of an example, a situation, you can have a life-threatening situation as maybe we saw in New Orleans or something like that, where you have where you have homes below sea level and a high levee around them. Um, so we had to start here for that reason too. I mean, it's it's the, it, it, it's it, engineering wise, it makes the most sense, and in terms of life safety, it makes the most sense. And, and wasn't it true as well in in 2012? Um, I understand that part of the levee 
in, in East Palo Alto became, I don't know if it became damaged or eroded. Um, how serious was that at, at that point and how critical was it to get that thing fixed up at least temporarily? Yeah, so in 2012 what we saw was, it wasn't a huge flow. Compared to 98 it was not very large. Um, but water did go over the levee in East Palo Alto. It also went through the levee in East Palo Alto and on the Palo Alto side by the golf course. And so that seepage through the levee, it actually goes kind of underneath and then comes back up the other side. We saw mm -hmm. it on both sides of the creek. It certainly indicates that the levees are in poor shape. I mean, the levees are not supposed to perform that way. The levees that are there now are not engineered. Um, they were basically piles of dirt that were put there de decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, what we did after 2012 was we put um, uh, chimneys around where water came up to kind of balance the hydraulics so that there was no more pressure for water to go out of the creek during high flows. But we also added about 18 inches to two feet on both sides of the creek with sandbags encased in concrete. And that's to keep the water from going over. So we knew at the time it was a Band-Aid. We were very worried, especially last year, about the El Nino coming. And so we did a lot of work in 2015, the summer and early fall 2015. Um, because of that concern, uh, but we knew that it, it wasn't solving the kind of integrity of the levees, which is what you're getting to. And so the levees are in poor shape, um, and we've been planning, uh, actually we've been in design on this project for six years. Permitting took a long time, 35 months to get permits, um, and so we've been trying to accelerate the pace of it. We're glad to be able to start construction this season, um, mm -hmm. and uh, we're just going to try to get done as quickly as possible because of the question. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, that really impresses me about this project is just the sheer number of constraints you guys have to overcome. I mean, first of all, uh, it's, it's pretty unusual for me. In, in some ways, it almost represents the best and the worst of bureaucracy, because on one hand, you have five different government agencies coming together, working together, kind of creating a sixth government agency, mm -hmm. and just having so many different people contribute money and kind of buy into this design and pursue it is, uh, to me, kind of rare. But at the same time, you also had the worst of bureaucracy, which is the permitting process you just mentioned, which has taken years and which has forced you guys to kind of modify the project in some minor ways, I believe, in the last few years as, as you've gone through the, the process of getting a permit, particularly from the State Water Board. Mm -hmm. uh, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges that um, the JPA had to overcome over the permitting processes and some of the ways that um, the project had to change to accommodate these kinds of demands and restrictions and the various sensitivities in the creek because not only are you dealing with bureaucracy, you're also dealing with salt marsh harvest mouse, the clapper rail and everything else that uh, is part of a, a rich baylands ecosystem. Right. I mean, it's, it was a challenge. We had property constraints because we had homes on one side and we had in, some, in the Palo Alto side, we have the school, we have the U.S. Postal Service facility, we have the athletic center and the golf course. Fortunately, the city was willing to part with about 12 acres of golf course. And as people probably know, there's another golf course, separate golf course project that's being started up right now mm -hmm. to, uh, to use that smaller footprint. Um, so we had land challenges. We also had challenges related to species, as you mentioned. There are three endangered species right there that use the creek and marsh area that, that um, provided kind of uh, some restrictions on the project. Um, those are the salt marsh harvest mouse, the steelhead that runs up the creek, and uh, as well as the clapper rail, which is now called Ridgeway Rail. So we had a bird, we had a fish, and we had a mouse. And all of those have different kinds of constraints, but they're all in the same area. And so if you, if you look at the schedule of construction, the only period of the calendar year, the 12 months that we have now for the next few years to construct, the only period that has no species restrictions is September 1 to October 15. And mm -hmm. you're trying to build a huge project, um, a $41.5 million project approximately on 7,000 feet of creek, and you only have six weeks of unfettered access to the project site, it creates a lot of constrictions. And that raises the price and makes it take longer to construct, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so those were issues. In terms of the, the multiple jurisdictions working together, I mean, this project has been in concept since the 1950s. We talked about that in the right. groundbreaking. Um, and, and so, you know, we're looking at over 60 years of people talking about what should we do in this area to address flooding. We've, as I said, we've been in design for about six years. Permitting took about three years. We knew going in that this is a very challenging area in terms of the, the geography and in terms of the species. We also knew that putting together a funding package that tried to spread the, the responsibility between the two sides of the creek um, would be a challenge. And so that what we did was we put together a funding agreement in 2014 with the estimated costs. 
we actually ran because of uh, of, a sp of the, the copper rail that showed up in a different part of the creek. We had to uh, go back and find a few more million dollars to address the longer construction season uh, or period. And if you think about it, if one city or county does a project like this, they can find the money. They either decide I'm going to take the money from somewhere else, or I'm going to find the money somehow, and they either do it and they don't do a project. With a project like this, we had to find about $3 million in about six weeks to start construction this year. And so we had to go to all six agencies, the JPA and the five agencies that created it. So it definitely created some interesting challenges. But, you know, the way we look at it, I think the board looks at it, our board or elected officials, one from each city or Santa Clara Valley Water District or San Mateo County, um, the way the board looks at it is that this is how government should be. These cities should be working together because the creek is a, is a dividing line between them. So you can't solve half the problem on one side. So mm -hmm. it's by necessity. And so it, it creates a different additional layer of challenges in addition to the geography of species. But it's a kind of challenge that fortunately I think our board and I relish kind of trying to piece together this puzzle where everybody has to move in the same direction when maybe these cities are not used to working together this closely on something where they're actually putting up money for something that benefits each other. And I, I do think, um, I did mention, uh, I used the word visionary, I think, earlier uh, in, in describing this project. One of the things that strikes me is, obviously, San Francisco Creek is kind of the big obstacle that people around it are seeing, especially during the winter and during flood years. But this project is actually also looking 50 years down the line. It's looking at sea level rise, mm -hmm. which it's kind of unusual, and it's kind of new. Uh, it's almost unprecedented for Project to sort to be also kind of preparing for the long-term future. Can you tell me a little about um, that aspect of it? And also, um, you mentioned uh, the, the challenges presented by the various uh, animals, native mm -hmm. species. But um, I understand that this project also has some ecological benefits in addition to flood control. So um, it'd be nice to talk about those sure. as well. And, and getting back to your last question, the project was changed uh, during right. the permitting process, and I didn't really address that. But there were there were parts of the project that were taken out, and there were parts of the project that were added. We feel like, at the end of the day, the project still achieves our flood protection benefit, mm -hmm. and there's probably more enhancements to the environment. So at the end of the permitting process, the project is probably a better project than it was at the beginning. Did it change much in terms of flooding, uh, providing protection to people? No. Um, but there are some other areas where it's, it's a better project. Um, and then in terms of... Uh, so sea, level sea level rise. Sea level yeah. rise yeah. So in terms of sea level rise, what we did uh, in 2010 when we started the design was, at that point people were already talking about sea level rise, but there wasn't this kind of present day energy around it and mm -hmm. a sense of urgency because of all these predictions of... Every, every, it seems like every predict time it's predicted it's, it's greater and it's a more extreme event that's coming for us. And at the time of 2010, we, the U.S. government was looking at three different scenarios for sea level rise. Um, and we chose for this project the most extreme scenario at the time, which was for a 50-year horizon, uh, it, was, it was 26 inches. And so we chose 26 inches of sea level rise. Now the scenarios are really all over the map um, in terms of 26 is probably on the low end. But it's not on the low end for 50 years. The scenarios that are much more aggressive than that are looking at 2100, which is 85, 84 years from now. So, so I think we're still in good shape. Um, also, we're taking into account sea level rise during an extreme tide, which in, in our definition only happens a couple times a year during a king tide, but mm -hmm. otherwise the daily high tide. In fact, what we're building is about uh, seven and a half to eight feet over the daily high tide. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we have a lot of coverage on sea level rise. In terms of this project being on the forefront of that issue, for a multi-jurisdictional problem, project is absolutely on the forefront. We're really proud of that and excited about it. Um, there are other projects around the state where one city is like building a seawall or what have you to deal with sea level rise concerns. Um, but in terms of a project that crosses city and county lines, there's nothing else out there that we've found um, that really does this. Now, that's going to be happening more and more, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, certainly sea level rise was something that we wanted to bake in um, to this. Uh, I mean, the principal Push, the principal uh, issue that was pushing the project along for years uh, was the creek flooding. Um, but you can't ignore the fact that, that creek water is commingled with bay water. And, uh, and we've, I've been out there on king tide days where there is very moderate creek flow and it's very high by East Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. So it was clear to us years ago that we needed to address the issue. So also, if, could you sort of in a nutshell describe what people would see when this project is finished? What will it look like? What are the different elements? Yeah. So right now, the creek, essentially, you walk along the levees on either side, and there's a lot of 
um, kind of shrubbery and grass, and then you have a narrow creek channel right in the middle. Um, what people will see that's different is you still have that narrow creek channel in the middle, but then you'll have what we call a marsh plain, which is a gradually rising marsh uh, on both sides. And then it, that marsh plain will, will end. It will be considerably wider than what you see now. And that marsh plain will end. And in the areas between, let's say, East Bay Shore Road, Highway 101, and the beginning of the Palo Alto Golf Course, there will be flood walls because we didn't have room to build wide levees there. And then from that point to the Friendship, a little bit beyond the Friendship Bridge, there will be levees, and the creek will be considerably wider than it is now. And so you'll still have this in channel, this narrow channel uh, surrounded by the marsh. At the Friendship Bridge, what you'll notice is quite different. Those Friendship Bridge will still be there, but there will be something called Friendship Island, which is on the Palo Alto side, instead of it, the Friendship Bridge being attached to a levee, it'll be its own footing an island, and we'll have a benches there, and we'll have some interpretive things there, and people can can stop there. And on the other side of the island from French Bridge, there'll be a boardwalk that connects to the new levee, uh, similar to the boardwalks that are around the Palo Alto Bay Lands area. And mm -hmm. so in that area, I'm really excited about that area because I think it'll be a huge improvement. It'll be, there will be some information. It's really that particular point, and I mentioned this in groundbreaking, that particular place of the Friendship Bridge is, it's obviously the, the intersection of bay and, and freshwater. So ecologically, it's interesting. Uh, because you have the marsh species and you have the creek species at the same time. It's also interesting in terms of sociology and, and communities. It's, a, it's, a, it's the connection point between the Palo Alto Golf Course and Airport on one side and the East Palo Alto community on the other. Mm -hmm. And it's worth talking about how this particular location of the creek is, uh, is kind of a bridge between these communities. And in this project, they've worked together, so it's, it's a bit of a metaphorical bridge, too. Um, but, you know, I really want to have that be the legacy point of this project, where people can go out there and, and enjoy the creek and enjoy the bay at the same time in one spot. And I think you've also mentioned that there, there are elements of this that are both uh, environmentally enhancing, but there will also be some things there for people as well. You mentioned the um, that there will be benches and things, mm -hmm. so will, will there be other elements as well that will kind of enhance the, well, human, the experience? human experience? There will be uh, better and greater access for people on the East Palo Alto side. One of the things we heard from the community of East Palo Alto is we're right along the bay, but our community, there, there's not an inviting way to get to the bay. And some people in East Palo Alto, many people in East Palo Alto access the trails along the bay, but not as many as the city would like. And so one of the elements of the project is to open up new um, pathways to the levee on the East Palo Alto side that are more inviting and easier to get to and handicapped accessible, and all the things that you would want in making a trail inviting to people. So that will be new and positive. On the Palo Alto side, it will be similar to what's there now in terms of the, um, there will be, I mean, the, going to the, the boardwalk will all be ADA accessible and all this kind of thing, but essentially you'll have a levee top trail that will connect the airport levee around the airport with Game Road by the Palo Alto Athletics at Baylands Athletic Center, and so that will be kind of similar. Um, it, it would just be it would be a better trail experience on both sides. But um, I think what people know is the mo more dramatic difference will be on the East Palo Alto side, which right now does not have very inviting access to the creek. So when we also talk about uh, we're talking about the lower portion now, basically everything mm -hmm. on the east side of the freeway. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's there are other aspects to this as well, right? There there's another project um, or, or segment or phase of the project that will be upstream. How many phases will there be? I know there's and can we talk a little bit about you know for Palo Altans what's what's going to yeah. be up up there and when that will happen? Yeah, too? certainly most of the residents of Palo Alto are very interested in kind of our next phase, and we've been talking about that for a long time, and we've been working on it for a long time. The, the next phase is upstream of Highway 101, as you mentioned. We, have, we, the JPA, have an EIR, an Environmental Impact Report, to analyze the benefits and impacts of a, of a suite of projects upstream of 101. So those include um, the replacement of removal and replacement of Pope Chaucer Bridge, widening of the creek, essentially between Newell Road, a little bit downstream of Newell, and Euclid Avenue, which is on the uh, Menlo Park side, Menlo East, East Palo Alto side. And, um, and so there's going to be creek widening there along Woodland Avenue and behind the homes in East Palo Alto. Um, Palo Alto has a project to replace uh, the Newell Bridge, and that project is 
very interesting, complicated project as well. I was going to ask, is yeah. the Newell Bridge project something that the JPA is involved with as well, or is that mostly a local project? Yeah. Because I do recall there was some dialogue about widening and kind of the, de the design aspects of it. Right. So the only, the only um, aspect of that project that we have been working on is the design, uh, as the design aspect for Creek Flow. Because we want to make sure that the bridge and the surrounding um, landscape abutting the bridge uh, enable us to do things like remove the Pope Chaucer Bridge and do that. Because mm -hmm. again, we don't want to send more water and then cause a problem by the Newell neighbors, right? Yeah, so, the Pope Chaucer so, Bridge, to the viewers who don't know, is uh, notorious for being yeah. either flooding or getting really close to flooding during like uh, right. major storm events. But right. Right. But so. right. And so, so the Newell Bridge replacement was part of our project at the JPA. Um, when we kind of dug into the issue with the community, it became clear that there were other issues there related to traffic and safety and, and parking and other kinds of things, um, that it became more of a local issue than just a flood, I mean, a broader suite of issues than just the flooding concern. So we still are working with the city closely and making sure that the new design accommodates the flood-related work, but in terms of parking and traffic and those things, uh, safety, um, the city's EIR and design process really taking the lead on that, as it should. Mm -hmm. And I know Palo Alto has the lead, but they're also working with the city of East Palo Alto closely because it's important to both sides. Um, so that, so new Pope Chaucer channel widening are part of the upstream work. Um, that would, if, after we do that, and we're already in design and all that, and the EIR is focusing clearly on that. After we do that, the, the design objective is that the 1998 flood would not flood any properties um, in Palo Alto, Menlo Park, East Palo Alto. Because the 98 flood was essentially about the same amount of water that can fit under Middlefield Road Bridge and University Avenue Bridge, they're about the same. And so by, by replacing Pope Chaucer, Newell, and doing some channel widening, the water that can get under Middlefield would then make it safely to the bay after Caltrans work is done and the Beta 101 stretch is done of the project we've been talking about. So that's that's our objective. Then beyond, but that doesn't get a hundred year creek flood protection upstream of the uh, Highway 101. That gets us to the 1998 event, which mm -hmm. is probably about a 40 to 50 year event. Mm -hmm. To get us to a hundred year protection, which is our kind of broader objective, because that people could get out of the flood insurance program who have to pay into it. Um, we would need an additional um, an additional project, and we're we're looking mostly right now at upstream detention of water. So during a big storm, keeping the water upstream and releasing it on our timetable, rather than exposing the floodplain area, the flood prone area of Palo Alto, Middle Park, East Palo Alto, to that water. So detaining the water during the storm, releasing it later, and um, and that's our, and so we have to work closely with Stanford on that because as we identified in 2009, um, the only suitable areas for upstream tension are on Stanford property. Stanford has a whole separate issue of looking at Searsville Lake and Dam. They've done a lot of work on that. We've been working closely with them on that. So there are opportunities there depending on where that project goes. There are also opportunities on other sites at Stanford campus. So, so how, that's, that's how, one issue. Go. How confident are you, Len, that Stanford's going to make land available for this kind of detention facility? Well, it, it, has, to be, it has to be in both of our interests. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't have any uh, notion that Stanford is just going to make it available because uh, it's, it's the right thing to do or the JPA is asking for mm -hmm. it. But uh, Stanford recognizes that they need to do something about Searsville Dam um, from an environmental aspect and there's flood, flooding issues as well. And so uh, they've been working hard at it. You know, I'm, I, don't, I'm, I can't prejudge what, the, what Stanford's going to do, but it, whether it's at Searsville or some other site, um, they recognize that uh, there are benefits to Stanford of working with us, and, and we share the recognition. Yeah. And, and you briefly mentioned uh, another uh, thing that I think is really important to the discussion, which is the flood insurance that the people around the creek have to have, have been having to pay, and many of them for that many of them the goal is to have to stop paying it. And it sounds like um, it will still take some time to get to that point, even with the significant improvements that the downstream project will have. So, um, so I'm curious. Uh, I know there was some talk in the past about having some kind of a tax district or some other alternative funding mechanism to kind of fund the necessary improvements um, that would allow them to kind of get out of the, the paying flood insurance. Is this something that's uh, still something that the JPA is considering, like uh, having like a special funding district? And what kind of where does that discussion stand? If right. Anyway? Well, uh, we have most of the funding to do the upstream work of bridges and channel widening. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we've been working on that in, in relation to completing the funding package on our Beta 101 stretch, 
we've been kind of also analyzing how much money we have. And our board is going to take a close look at that this fall. Um, so, so we have most of the money, and I think we'll have all the money to do Pope Chaucer, um, Newell Bridge, uh, um, and the channel widening areas. Then the question would be, getting to your point of, if you want to reduce the flood insurance premium obligations by residents and businesses, um, where does the additional money come from? It really depends on what, what aspect uh, of the project we take. Upstream tension is one. We've also looked at a, a bypass channel under the roads, uh, probably of Palo Alto, although it could be Woodland Avenue, and then flood walls, which I've been talking about. Um, there's a lot of resistance to flood walls and large flood walls in the creek, and, and we recognize that, and we've heard that in and thought clear. Um, but our EIR will, EIR will flush all those issues out. In terms of how to pay for it, beyond replacing the bridges and going to that 100-year protection project, we are looking at an assessment district still. It, it would be in kind of um, in the context of shoreline work too. And so we have, a, when, when you say what are the other projects, we, we construction on this phase one by the between the bay and one one, we have the second phase of the creek work, and then very closely related topic of our work on the shoreline. That's a project called Safer Bay, it's an acronym, and it goes from Mountain View to Redwood City. And that's important for the assessment district because, for example, the people that are brought out of the floodplain um, between the bay and Highway 101, they're also in the bay floodplain on both sides, mm -hmm. Palo Alto and East Palo Alto sides. And for them to actually get out of the flood insurance obligation completely, we need to also work on the bay levees, and mm -hmm. uh, which are in dire need of, of repair, and, and, and there's a lot of marsh restoration aspects to that, that effort. So we have this other project. So what we're looking at is not just an assessment district to, to, to ramp up a, a 1998 level protection, 200 year level protection of the creek, but also kind of wrap in uh, um, funding for this Safer Bay project. Um, and that would bring in a significant uh, amount of um, opportunity for funding from Menlo Park, which is maybe not so much if we're just looking at the creek issues because the floodplains are, are predominantly uh, in terms of historical flooding, predominantly in Palo Alto and East Palo Alto. So we're, we are uh, looking at that issue of an assessment district. We're also, we have some private funding um, from Facebook on our Safer Bay project, and um, Caltrans and PG&E have expressed an interest in joining the project in terms of funding. So we're, we're it's kind of one of the more interesting things about all of these projects is come, putting together the funding package, because it's not just these six public agencies, but there are other agencies out there that have a strong stake in the success of the projects. And, uh, and so we're trying to make sure that they, are, they have responsibility um, for uh, contributing to the benefits that they receive. Well, pretty impressed with how many projects you guys have going on at once, even though they are kind of phased out. So uh, well done, Len. I, I, but I did want to kind of loop back to the, the, the kind of the one that's happening right now, the mm -hmm. downstream 101. Um, I believe that's set to be completed in 2018. Correct. And so, when do you expect most of the construction uh, to take place? Because I understand there are restrictions because of the migration. And what kind of impacts people should expect? Because as people driving 101 know yeah. that even, oh, yeah. even laudable projects have sometimes unbearable impacts. So, yeah. I want to give people a heads up. Right. This is what to expect. So, right. um, yeah. So, so, the 101 so project, to, to just uh, kind of mention that, the, the, that one is the Caltrans project, and mm -hmm. that one is slated to end in. Um, about November of 2017. So it has this year and then next year. Uh, and when I say year, it's really May to mid-October because um, mm -hmm. of the, the species constrictions. In terms of our project, um, it is through late 2018, through late 2018. And this year, what we're looking at is uh, work being done by the International School to uh, build a retaining wall for the new flood walls and work to remove vegetation uh, and trees and uh, start work on the outside, on the Palo Alto side levee in the golf course. And mm -hmm. that's the work that we're looking at for 2016. Mm -hmm. 2017 will be the major year, as far as we can tell right now, the major year for construction. Um, and what that means is taking down the existing levees and according to the contractor, um, building both the new, completing the construction of the new levees and building the flood walls all in one year. And so again, one year is really late May through probably end of October. Mm -hmm. um, so that is going to be a huge impact. Now the golf course project is happening at the same time. The golf course project is starting up right now. So in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, there will be already impacts because of that project. And so I don't know that people would, I, and it's, I think it's, even though it's complicated in terms of the logistics and sequencing and so many contractors at the same place at the same time, 
for the community, it's better to obviously get the stuff out of the way as much as right. possible at the same time. Um, so I, I imagine that in 2017, for the people that live in East Palo Alto, the international school, the, basically anybody in that part of the world, um, there's going to be significant impacts. And mm -hmm. we're going to try to get as much of the impacts done in that one, one year of 2017. In 2018, there will be a lot of work to do, but we hope that it's... Um, the kind of work that you kind of finish, the finishing touches of things like the boardwalk connection, and these mm. things that are less uh, kind of major construction activities. Mm. So there's going to be a lot of impact. Where we, um, the, one of the important impacts, which we're right now, <laughs> this week and next week, trying to assess and reduce, is the trail uh, on the Palo Alto side levee from uh, the Palo Alto Athletic Center to the Friendship Bridge is going to have significant periods of closure. Um, next year for sure, but it's going to start already in 2016. So figuring out that closure, when the contractor needs to be there, and so there's no safety issue with people walking or biking, um, and then giving people enough of a heads up, that's a, a major public outreach challenge. And then there's going to be a lot of truck traffic, because we're building new levees. There's thousands of trucks that are going to be coming in. We're going to reuse as much of the levee material from the existing levees as we can, but we'll have to bring in new material as well. So there will be a lot of impacts. And I imagine there are going to be people that are going to be happy about that in the next few years. Um, and I understand that, and we're just trying to do the best we can to predict and then notify. Well, certainly for a project that's taken this long to get off the ground and it's finally starting, uh, between May and October of next year sounds like the, the worst impact. It doesn't seem like too big a price to pay for something of that scope. Hopefully. But and we certainly look forward to following it as it unfolds and covering it when the work is complete. And so I um, just want to thank you, Len, for coming in and talking to us about this. Uh, pleasure. As always, uh, great having you. For our coverage of the Creek Project and all other news relating to Palo Alto, please check us out at paloaltoonline.com. Thank you for joining us. See you next week. <laughs>